audience. So uh, our next talk is by Kaushik and uh, Kapil. They're going to talk about shift left performance testing using micro benchmark. Okay. I'll speak a little about the speakers. Uh, Kapil is a senior consultant with ThoughtWorks who has overall eight years of experience as a quality analyst. In that, two plus years in ThoughtWorks. He's passionate about exploring new techs and processes that help the QA community. He's currently working on a data project in the people domain. Talking about Kaushik, Kaushik is a senior consultant at ThoughtWorks with seven plus years of experience. He's been working with ThoughtWorks for over a year, uh, passionate about learning new tech stacks and processes. He's currently working in the event-driven architecture based system. That's about Kaushik and Kapil. So uh, a little about the topic, shift left performance testing using microbench. Uh, in this talk, they'll be discussing the problems that we face when doing the performance testing in the later part of the testing cycle and how to overcome with the shift left approach using mi micro benchmark. We'll also demonstrate how to implement micro benchmarking using JMH. Uh, so over to you, Kaushik and Kapil. Yeah, thanks, Kenuri, for the introduction. Hello, people. Uh, a very good afternoon. I, I hope you all had a good insights from the previous talks. So without any delay, let's get started. Uh, let me share my screen. Could someone please confirm whether my screen is visible? Uh, yes, couple. It is visible. Yes, it is. Yeah, yes. thanks. Sir. So I'm going to start with uh, what is the importance of uh, 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 sorry performance testing. Uh, so, you know, like I have seen a project which follows agile methodology where they're not conducting the performance test for each sprint before they are going live. So let's say what happens if the application's performance degraded uh, due to the newly added code that we have delivered in the previous sprint. So that is going to impact the end users who is using these applications uh, for the quite some time now, right? So, you know, like uh, we have to give equal importance to the uh, performance test or any non-functional test uh, uh, as same as the functional test. So with that, let's move on to the topic. So before jumping into the shift left and micro benchmark approach, uh, let's understand what are the challenges we may face if we identify any code bottlenecks from the system when we are doing the performance test in the later stage of the development life cycle. Uh, you know, there is a mindset, uh, there is a misconception that it is good to test the application as a whole uh, for performance. Uh, that leads to conduct the performance testing in the later part of the development life cycle. So let's see what are the challenges are. Um, so when we find uh, any code bottleneck in the system in the later part of the life cycle. So the first one is the debugging. Uh, you know, like uh, debugging takes more time as it is difficult to identify uh, which part of the code causing this issue. Also, most of the time developers cannot reproduce the performance bug in their uh, local machine or in the development environment. So as we have identified the performance bug in the later stage, uh, so the time and the effort in fixing that bug uh, will be increased. Uh, you know, like in order to fix the code bottleneck, the developer have to fix the code. Uh, so, you know, like uh, since the code changes happens, we QAs have to uh, rerun the functional regression test along with the performance test. And uh, it has to be repeated till the performance bug gets fixed. So when these challenges are in, uh, our uh, release plan is going to delay and it will have a direct impact on the business as well. So to overcome these challenges, uh, what we have to do, we have to do our uh, performance testing in the early stage of the development life cycle with the shift left approach. You know, like uh, by shifting the performance test towards to the left in the CI pipeline, um, you can test early and often, uh, which helps to in identifying the more number of bugs in the earlier stage and you can optimize that to increase the qu overall quality of the product. So now let's see what are the benefits uh, in doing the shift left. Uh, you can get the early feedback. Yeah, Having the performance testing in the early stage, uh, you can get the faster feedback for any improvement that needs to be done in the system. And uh, you can save the time, like uh, you can reduce the time to market uh, as we have covered most of the tests in the earlier stages. So that the efforts that we usually put in at the later stage in the QA phase uh, would be drastically reduced. And uh, shifting left means increasing the collaboration uh, between the testers and the QAs, I mean, the testers and the developers. Uh, so uh, when uh, both developers and QAs working together, uh, it is easy to identify what all needs to be tested uh, for the performance. Also, you would often have to pair with the developers, maybe writing the performance test uh, in the development phase or giving them the scenarios in order to cover what, uh, what needs to be covered uh, in, uh, when it comes to the performance. 
Um, and then like usually we will define the KPIs. Uh, KPIs is nothing but key performance indicators uh, at the application level when we are doing the traditional performance system in the later stage. Um, with the shift left, you can also define the KPIs for the module or the sub-module levels. Uh, in other words, you can define that in the method. Uh, so, which will aid in uh, improving the efficiency and the performance of the smaller units. So, you know, like uh, we have to write the performance just in the earlier stage means uh, you have to write that in the development phase along with the unit test or the integration test once the logical code is implemented. And in the CI pipeline, you have to keep the performance test next to the unit test and it should run before it, the code is being deployed to any environment. So, typically your CI pipeline would look like this. So with that, like, uh, let's uh, talk about like, what are the different types of uh, performance bottlenecks uh, that the system can occur? So the first one is the hardware bottleneck, uh, which can, which could occur due to the uh, excessive usage of uh, CPU memory or the disk. So let's see one by one. Uh, the CPU usage bottlenecks uh, can occur when there are too many processes running on a CPU core. Uh, the system may fail to respond on the time, uh, causing the, the CPU become overloaded. You know, like uh, if the CPU uh, uh, utilization exceeds more than 70 percentage, it is considered as a bottleneck. And when it comes to the memory bottlenecks, uh, so memory bottleneck is, refers to the memory shortages due to the insufficient memory or uh, any uh, 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 memory leakages that happens or any defective program that consumes more memory. And uh, the memory uh, uh, bottlenecks can be easily identified with the memory errors that we get from the server side, uh, such as out of memory or any timeouts exception uh, while occurring the memory resource to get allocated. And uh, when come to uh, come to the disk usage bottlenecks, here the disk refers to the computer storage uh, which we will use to store any data for the persistent use. So if the disk is unable to um, read or write any data at a specific rate at per operation is considered as a bottleneck here. So with that, uh, the next bottleneck is the hardware bottleneck. Uh, um, you know, like, uh, sorry, the network bottleneck. You know, like, uh, the network bottleneck can occur when the communication happening between the two devices, which lacks in the necessary bandwidth. Uh, so to complete the uh, to complete the task quickly. So that considered as a network bottleneck. So the network bottleneck mainly occurs in the three instances when the communication happening between the client and the server, or within, between the client and the databases, or uh, uh, between the servers and the uh, any third party servers. So the next is the code bottleneck. Uh, you know, like any poorly written code or any insufficient algorithms that uh, that may cause the code related bottleneck in your system. Also from code, we perform uh, various IO operations like uh, um, storing or retrieving a data from the databases or any external files that may also impact the performance of the code uh, when we are using uh, uh, any complex query or any um, incorrect join statement to retrieve the data that may take longer time to respond back. So this is one uh, such case for the IO related or the code related bottleneck scan your system may occur. So the last uh, bottleneck could be the infra configuration. Uh, you know, like uh, sometimes we may fail to add the appropriate number of CPU instances or uh, um, minimum or maximum uh, container counts that may result in the bottleneck. You know, like uh, among these bottlenecks, uh, the code bottlenecks contribute significantly to the application's uh, performance. So if you find uh, any code related bottlenecks in the later stage of the development life cycle, that would be more costly to fix, like we have seen the challenges before. Um, so it has to be identified in the earlier stage and it has to be fixed. So let's see how to identify the code related bottlenecks in the early stage with the using of micro benchmark. So what is the micro benchmark here? So it is the process to measure the performance of the uh, smaller unit of the code in an isolation environment. Typically it can be a single method or a feature. So you, you can compare the micro benchmark test with the unit test, uh, like uh, which is considered as a false failing approach for the performance. So with the use of micro benchmark in the early stage, you can easily identify what are the uh, code bottlenecks your, your system has. So let's see when to use the micro benchmark here. Uh, so like uh, we use profilers to monitor the entire applications, right? So if we identify any code bottlenecks from that, uh, it would be more difficult to identify which part of the code is causing this issue. So at that time, like we can use the micro benchmark to pinpoint the code which is causing this bug. 
and uh, you know like sometimes we may use uh, or we may write multiple algorithms to solve any problem statements so uh, but we are not unsure like uh, which algorithm we have to go for uh, when it comes to the performance right so for that like you can use the micro benchmark to determine which algorithm is more performant and uh, you can use the micro benchmark uh, to ensure that the existing code performance is not uh, degraded due to the newly added core or any code enhancement that has been done. So basically, like you can use the micro benchmark as a, a performance regression test. And you can use micro benchmark in the big data scope uh, where uh, you can implement the micro benchmark within the clusters or within the algorithms. So that they uh, help to obtain the information on uh, volume and the uh, accuracy of the data. So, you know, like uh, um, when you want to identify the execution time of any method, right? The first thing that we will do, the, the first thing that comes to our mind is uh, calculating the difference between the start and the end time, similar to this code, uh, uh, Java code snippet. So, you know, like uh, this is the wrong way of measuring the performance of the code uh, because uh, it does not produce an accurate result that you could get in the protection. Um, so let's see what are the challenges with this approach. So the first one is the iteration, you know, like uh, uh, this code has not I, um, iterated multiple times, uh, you know, like to get the proper uh, accurate result or the consistent result over the time, you have to iterate your, uh, uh, iterate multiple times against the uh, uh, code. So that that's how you have to get the accurate result of the, any uh, method that you are running against. So the next is the compiler optimization, you know, like uh, this uh, approach is fails to simulate the production scenario, you know, like uh, in production, regardless of any programming languages, you know, compilers will do a lot of optimization as longer it is running in the production. So this up, with this approach, you could not uh, 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 get that uh, production behavior here. So the next is the isolation. Um, so since the code was not run in an isolation environment, the execution time that we have got uh, could, could have been influenced with the any C, a CPU process that is running in your machine. So the next is the multi-threading. You know, like uh, the execution time that was derived from this approach has, uh, was not uh, uh, against the multi-threads. So this was run with the single threads. So when when it uh, when it when we run this uh, uh, method against the multi-thread, we would have seen a different score over there. So uh, so in order to write a proper micro benchmark test or to in order to uh, identify the proper score for the uh, any method, the uh, you have to keep these four points in the mind. So uh, uh, so you can write your own framework with these uh, following these four points, or you can uh, leverage the any micro benchmark tools that is really available in the market to overcome these challenges. So, so far we have discussed like what are the challenges in doing the performance testing in the later stage and uh, how to overcome that with the shift left and the micro benchmark approach uh, when we have uh, uh, the code related bottlenecks in our system. So now we may have a question, uh, should we move away from the traditional performance testing that we are doing in the later stage? Um, so I would say no, uh, because with the help of micro benchmark test, you could only identify the code related bottlenecks, uh, but the other infra bottlenecks like uh, um, hardware or network or any configuration that can be only identified in the production or in the production like environment where the similar configuration has been set up. So you should still continue with the traditional performance testing, but uh, not like before. Uh, so you can have a, a profiler in place to monitor your uh, uh, the entire application uh, that could also help in identifying this uh, infra bottlenecks. So with that, let's see like uh, where the micro benchmark will fit in in the test pyramid. So as we are writing this micro benchmark test in the earlier stage next to the unit test, so this will this can very well fit in in the bottom layer of the pyramid. And, uh, you know, like the traditional performance testing is also called as a macro benchmarking, the benchmarking terms. So that remains in the same place in the top of the pyramid. So let's talk about the KPIs that you can define in, when you are writing the micro benchmark test uh, for your code. Uh, so the first one is the th throughput. Uh, so it is the number of invocations uh, that the method can handle in a given period of time. Uh, so the next one is the response time. It is the time taken for a method to execute uh, using the single or multiple threads. Usually like uh, response time can be calculated with the average or any percentile metrics. 
and the lower the response time, uh, you can achieve the better uh, performance of the code. So the next one is the error rate. It is the number of method invocations resulting in error uh, when comparing to the total method invocations. So you have to minimize your error rate in order to achieve the high performance uh, in your system. So the next one is the latency. It is the time spent by a thread in a queue before uh, executing any methods. Um, the next one is the bandwidth. Uh, it is the high volume of data that your method can handle in a given period of time. And uh, CPU utilization is uh, like, uh, it is the amount of CPU utilized when you are executing your benchmark method in an isolation. And the memory usage similar to that, like it is the amount of memory used while executing the code in an isolation. So these are some popular micro benchmark tools that is available in the uh, market respect to the languages. So in this demo, uh, in today's demo, we are going to uh, show what is JMH and how we can write a micro benchmark test with the JMH. Let's, uh, before that, let's talk about why we have gone with the JMH when we are having other micro benchmark tools. Uh, the first, like, first of all, like JMH stands for Java Micro Benchmark Harness. As we already know, this is to, this used to write the benchmarking test. So JMH was created by the same team who developed the Java virtual machines. Uh, so they know very well what uh, Java JVM is doing and what is the best way to implement the benchmarking test against the JVM. So these are some key features uh, that the JMH supports. Uh, so the first one is the warm-ups. Like I said, uh, this is one of the key features. You have to do uh, some warm-ups to avoid the code optimization and uh, get the uh, uh, similar behavior that you get in the production when you are uh, calculating the score. Uh, so like uh, JVM optimized the code for each run. Uh, so the uh, the code execution gets faster the longer it is running in the real time. Uh, so it is necessary to do the warmups. Uh, so before we, we are calculating the measurement. Uh, so by default, JMH will do uh, certain warmups, like it will do five uh, iterations before it is measuring the performance of the code. Uh, so you can also configure that if you want to increase the warm-up iterations, you can also increase that with the JMH. Uh, next is the JVM optimization. Uh, you know, like uh, JVM will do some of the optimi optimization, like uh, dead code elimination or the constant folding, which we'll be seeing in the demo detail. Um, so with JMH, you can trick those, uh, uh, you know, trick the JVM to not optimize those uh, dead code elimination in order to uh, get the accurate uh, benchmark scores. And with JMH, you can run your benchmark test in an isolation. And uh, um, when it comes to the annotation, like JMH is completely driven by the annotations, uh, which is easy and easy, easy and uh, uh, easy to configure anything that we needs to be uh, set up for the benchmark test. And uh, JMH runs, it's, uh, uh, you can run the benchmark test in JMH using a single or multiple, even the group of threads, you can able to configure it. And JMH supports uh, quiet profilers like uh, yeah, some internal profilers, also it supports some external profilers. Some notable internal profilers are uh, uh, stack profilers, which, which can show you the uh, thread state distributions and uh, GC profilers, which can show you the memory usage when your benchmark test is running. And the external profilers like async profilers, which, uh, which can show you the CP usage. Um, and when it comes to the reporting part, uh, so by default, JMH, JMH will give you the uh, consolidated summary report in the console. But if you, if you want, you can extract that in uh, JSON or the CSV formats. And uh, J uh, JMH supports few uh, KPIs that we have seen in the previous slides, like throughput, uh, the response time with uh, um, average and the percentile metrics and the error rate. And other KPIs like uh, memory usage, CPU usage, and the latency can be achieved with the profilers, internal or external profilers, like I mentioned before. So the config, you can also configure the garbage collection with the JMH. If you don't want uh, the garbage collection to take part when you are executing the benchmark test, that is also possible with the JMH. And uh, you can also have uh, pass the JVM uh, arguments at the runtime when you are executing the benchmark test. So <clears throat> with that, we have come to the demo time. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Kaushik to uh, demonstrate us how to write the micro benchmark test uh, using JMH. Over to you, Kaushik. Hey, Kapil. So thanks for passing it to me. So let me share my screen. OK. So can someone confirm whether my screen is visible or not? Yeah, Kaushik, we can able to see your screen. So then, hello, folks. So throughout this demo, we'll see like what are all the core concepts that are there in JMH with small examples, OK? 
So in the first example, we'll see like what are all the annotations that, that are supported by JMH and we'll see how do we write a proper micro benchmark test by including these annotations, okay? So in the first example, we have created a method called hello world. So let's see how do we convert this hello world method as a micro benchmark test, okay? So the first thing what we have to do here is to add this at benchmark annotation. So which implies this hello world as a micro benchmark test. So like one can compare this at benchmark annotation similar to the at test annotation that we use it in the testing libraries like JUnit or testng, right? So the next is fork annotation. So the concept of forks ensures that the hello world method is executed in an isolated environment and the value inside fork determines the total execution cycle of it. So let's say if the fork value is set as two means, so on runtime, JMH will create two new virtual environments and all the tests will be executed there as a test cycle. And the next annotation is warm up. So before I'm before I start measuring the performance of this hello world method, right? I have to perform certain warm up iteration, so which it will make the JVM to optimize certain part of the code, which it does it in the production like environment. Okay. So here by default, JMH will set all the warm up iterations by default as why. And if you want to customize it, we can make use of this at warm up annotation. And inside this annotation, we can configure the iteration and uh, duration of each iteration select. And the next one is measurement iteration. So sorry, the next one is measurement annotation. So now I'm done with configure the warm up for this. Now I have to start measuring the performance of this hello world. For that, I can make use of this measurement annotation. So similar to warm up, measurement iterations are also set to five. And if I want to customize it, I can make use of this annotation. And if I want to run this hello world method with multiple threads, I can make use of this a thread annotation. And the last one is output time unit. So if I want to customize my benchmark result time unit, I can make use of this annotation. So by default, the results are set to seconds here in this example, I'm just modifying it to milliseconds. So these are some of the annotation which are actually going to override the JMH default configuration. Even without these annotation, a micro benchmark test can be executed. Provided we have this at benchmark annotation, which is kind of mandatory here, okay? So let's see how do we run this. To run this, we have to make use of this option builder class provided by JMH, which has a method called include in it, okay? So here we have to pass in the class name in which we are writing the micro benchmark test. And with the help of runner.run object, we can run the micro benchmark test. So at runtime, what JMH does is it will find the method that is decorated with at benchmark annotation and it will start running all the, it will start running the hello, hello world method with all the configurations that we have listed here, okay? So let us get into the console. For saving my time, I just already executed this. Uh, we'll just get into the console and see what happens behind the scene, okay? So this is where my execution starts with fork value one of one. And these are the warm up iterations that I have configured in the, uh, in the annotation and e under each warm up iteration these many times the method has been invoked and one important thing to note here is any any results that are obtained from these warm up iterations will be excluded from calculating the consolidated scores okay and these are my measurement iterations and any results that are obtained obtained from these iterations will be used for calculating the consolidated score so this is what my consolidated score looks like so this is what my consolidated score and the here benchmark determines the benchmark name against which we are running here in this case it is hello world so the cmt here uh, represents the total measurement iterations and the score is the actual performance score which we are looking for this hello world method and the error here determines the confidence level of score that is obtained here so let's say if the error score is 20 percentage of what we have it in the obtained score we can consider this hello world is having certain bottlenecks in it and we can also see there is some plus minus symbol here, right? So which determines two confidence score, a score that is added with error and a score that is subtracted with error. So the last thing is about mode. So we'll see in the next example, like what are all the modes that are supported by JMH and what are all the metrics that it is going to give, okay? So we'll quickly move on to the next example. So let's say I have a micro benchmark method here. And if I want to know what is my throughput metrics for this method, I have to add another annotation called at benchmark mode. Uh, and the mode has to be set as throughput here. So as I said earlier on execution, this will be executed with the warm up iterations that we have configured and all the measurement iterations that we have configured. And it is going to give me a consolidated score here. So the throughput metrics for my first warm up, uh, throughput metrics for my first measurement iteration is 2.361 operations per microsecond. And for my second iteration, it is set as 5.223 operations per microsecond. So what JMH does is it actually takes the average between these two iterations and it is going to give us a consolidated score, which is here. 
So overall, if I want to know the throughput score of this micro benchmark method, it is uh, 3.792 operations per microseconds. So now I'm done with calculating what is my throughput metrics for this. If I want to know what is the response time metrics for this method, I can use this average time. So which is going to give the average response time for this micro benchmark method. And as I said, for throughput, it is going to take the average between two measurement iteration and it is going to give us a consolidated average response time score. So here it is. So the average response time score for this method is 0.325 microseconds. So if I want to know what is the response time in percentile format, I can make use of this sample time. So which is going to give me a response time with detailed percentile report. So it starts from percentile zero to percentile 100. And if I want to know what is my 50th percentile response time, I can easily get it from the console. See, uh, if I want to know my 50th percentile, it is 0 0.956 microseconds. And there is also another mode called a single shot time. So which is used to measure the time taken for a single method invocation. Let me run it now. Okay, so these single shot metrics, sorry, these single shot mode are actually used to measure what is the volume metrics. So we also have a separate example on identifying the volume metrics in the later part of demo. So we'll just come back to that. The time taken for a single method invocation for this micro benchmark method is uh, set to B3.184 operations per microseconds. So if I want to measure the micro benchmark method with all the four modes that we saw now, we also have another mode called all. And by default, if we haven't configured the mode, then JMH will take the default uh, matrix mode as throughput here. So these are the four modes that are available in JMH, which is going to give the matrix related to throughput response time in various formats as well. So with this context, we'll move on to the next example called state. Okay, so let's say I have a micro benchmark method here. So I have a micro benchmark method here called increment. So now I have a special use case to test this micro benchmark method with various data combinations. So how am I going to do that? So for that, I can make use of this at param annotation that is provided by JMH. And inside this, I can pass in the list of values against which the increment method can be tested. So on completion, JMH is giving me a detailed report with argument value as one and argument value as two. So which helps me to find the variations between matrices. For example, if I want to know what is the single shot time for this increment method with param value as one, I can just refer it here, which is 412.681 microsecond. Similarly, with the param value as two, I can just refer it here, which is 338.460 microseconds, right? So before moving further, we also have to note an important thing here, which means here we can see we are running this increment method with multiple threads, right? So what will happen to the state of this argument object when we are running it with multiple threads? So in order to control the state of this argument object, JMH, JMH is giving another annotation called state, so which comes up with various scopes in it. So let's see what scope dot benchmark first. So let's say if one of my thread is making changes to this argument object, and if I want all the other threads to be aware of these changes, I can use scope dot benchmark here. So to demonstrate the scope sharing across all the threads, we are actually performing an incremental operation here and we are just printing the value in it. So in my console, we can see in my warm-up iteration, my first thread is going to make some changes to the param value S1, which is resulted in two. And the next thread is aware of this. So instead of creating a new instance of this one, it is going to perform an incremental operation with the previous thread result. So which resulted in two and three here. So this shows the state is shared across all the threads now, correct? And there is also another scope called thread. So it is quite opposite to what we discussed about benchmark here. So let's say if one of my if one of my thread is making some changes to this argument object, and if I do not want all the other threads to be aware of these changes, I can make use of this scope dot thread here. So looking into the console, now we can see even though the first thread makes some changes, the other thread is not aware of it. So instead of sharing the same object reference, it is creating a new instance of argument value one, which is resulted in two and two here, right? And the last scope is about thread group. So let's say if I'm running this micro benchmark method with the thread group, so this is how we have to create a thread group now. So, and I'm assigning two threads to this group. And if one of my thread is making some changes to this argument object, and if I want only the threads belonging to this group should be aware of these changes, I can make use of this scope called group here. So one key takeaway here is if we are using this at param annotation, it is important that we use state annotation always with any of the scopes configured inside, okay? 
So yes, uh, with this, we move on to the next example, fixtures. So fixtures are similar to the add before and add after annotation that we use it in JUnit or testng libraries. So which is actually going to uh, segregate the prerequisite configuration code from our micro benchmark test method, right? So here, fixtures comes up with two annotation. So that is setup and tear down. So let's say any method that is annotated with setup will be executed before the micro benchmark test, and any method that is decorated with tear down executes after the micro benchmark test. Okay. So here, the setup and tear down comes up with various level. So let's see what level dot trial is about. So if setup and tear down is decorated with level dot trial, it means it will be executed only once at the start and end of the execution. Here we can see do setup is called at the start of iteration and do tear down is called at the end of iteration, right? Similar to that, the next level is uh, iteration. So which means the setup and tear down will be called before the start of iteration and after the iteration. So this is applicable for both warm up and measurement iterations that we have configured here. Okay, so here we can see the do setup is called before the iteration start and the do, do tear down is called at the end of iteration. Okay, so as I said earlier, so these uh, fixtures are going to segregate the prerequisite configuration from our micro benchmark test, which is, make, which is, use, which is helpful for uh, making the code to look uh, uh, cleaner and healthier as well. So I just have a chat conversation here. Let me have a quick look. So a couple, are there any unanswered questions still now? Would we like uh, to no question. We can okay. continue. Thanks for that couple. We will just proceed further. So the next example is on batch size. So let's say I have a method called uh, print current iteration. And the special use case for me now is to loop this particular code for 10 times on each method invocation. So in this case, the one thing that comes to my mind to achieve my use case is to use any of the looping concepts, right? But the problem having looping concepts inside is any code that is written inside this micro benchmark test will be used for calculating the consolidated score. So in order to achieve my special use case, I just wanted to exclude the looping concept from my micro benchmark method. And it has to be a kind of standalone stuff, right? So that is what the concept of batch size is doing here. So let's see how this works here. So I'm just running this micro benchmark test method with a single shot time, and I haven't configured batch size for warm up iteration. I have configured batch size for my measurement iterations. Okay. So in my console, I can see uh, the warm up iteration is just invoked only once, and for my measurement iteration, since I have configured batch size, it is invoked for ten times here. So the key takeaway from batch size here is if we are writing a micro benchmark test, it is recommended to use batch size instead of for loop. So which is going to give us an accurate result when we use batch size, okay? So yes, with this, uh, we'll move on to the next example called decode elimination. So we know there are various JVM optimization that does, right? So one such thing is decode elimination. So if the decode elimination is identified as part of our micro benchmark test method here, the result or the score that we get is incorrect or it, can, it is kind of meaningless because so we'll just see what how this decode elimination is impacting the score that we are getting now. So in this example, I have a method called add to numbers, which is actually performing a uh, computation and it is returning a value here. Okay. So I'm just trying to micro benchmark this add to numbers inside this method. I'm just running it now. So I'm running it with various warm up iterations and measurement iterations now. So behind the scenes, what JVM does is it identifies that the value returned from add to numbers is not used anywhere else in the code. So it will actually consider it as a dead code and it will be eliminating it from the stack. So even though the dead code is identified in our micro benchmark method, we'll still get a result, which is kind of inaccurate or meaningless, right? Because the dead code is already found, JVM optimized it in order to find the performance. So how we are going to overcome this? To overcome this, we have to use a method that is provided by JMH called blackhole.consume. So uh, we have to actually pass the return value inside this consume method and we have to run it again. So while running with blackhole.consume at runtime, what, JM, uh, what JVM identifies is the value that is used inside consume is used somewhere else in the code. So it will not eliminate or it will not optimize any part of the code to fine tune the performance. So now when we, when we come and look back to the results again here, we can see that there is a drastic difference in the score that is obtained which is a kind of accurate one and uh, the right way to measure the performance here. 
So it is important that we write, when we write a micro benchmark test method, it is important that we use black hole dot consume method in order to eliminate the dead codes from our micro benchmark test. Okay. So with this, we are going to the next concept called profilers. So profilers here in JMH are similar. Uh, profilers here in JMH are similar to the external profilers that we use. It can be the IntelliJ profilers or it can be your kit profiler. So which is going to give all the metrics related to the CPU utilization, memory utilization, and thread latency metrics and all, right? So here in this example, we'll see how do we configure all the profilers along with the micro benchmark test that we are writing it here. So in order to configure the profiler, I have to make use of this option builder class, which is having a method called add profiler. Inside this, the first tag profiler is used to identify what is the thread latency matrix. And for the next profiler, it is GC profiler. So which is going to give me a matrix related to the memory utilization. And the third one is uh, async profiler, which is going to give me a matrix related to the CPU utilization. So async profiler is actually an external profiler. And in order to configure it, in order to configure, configure it here inside my micro benchmark method, I have to add an environment variable in the runtime configuration. So the variable name should be dyld library path, so which is mentioned here. So we have to download the async profiler code base from the GitHub and we need to set this path. So once we are done with path setting, we can just run it as similar to how we run the earlier test, okay? So before getting into the result, we'll see what happens in, in this micro benchmark test, okay? So I'm trying to find out what is the throughput metrics of this is valid email by running it for one warm up iteration and one measurement iterations. So along with that, we are also evaluating what is going to be the CPU memory and thread latency metrics, right? So at the end of execution, JMH is giving me a throughput matrix, which we can see it in the bottom of console here. So the throughput score for this method is uh, 2653.123 operations per microsecond. So let us get into the result that is obtained from stack profiler here, okay? Okay, so this is what the result that is provided by stack profiler, which is thread state distribution. So here we can see 14.5% uh, percentage of my threads are in waiting stage, which is the actual thread latency matrix, which we are looking out for. And we'll just get into the next uh, profiler result, which is GC profiler. So GC profiler is giving us the memory utilization matrix, right? So if you want to know what is the total memory allocated for the entire micro benchmark run, you can just refer this gc.allocate.rate, which is uh, 2245.803 MB per second. And if you want to know what is the total heap space memory that is occupied for the entire micro benchmark run, you can refer your Eden space and survival space here. So Eden space refers to the memory that got allocated for the newly created object during the JMH execution. And uh, the total memory allocated for newly created object is uh, 23.7.883 MB per second. And survival space represents the memory that got uh, uh, deviated from garbage collection, which is identified in the survival space here. So the memory allocated for that is 1.481 MB per second. So apart from these metrics, the GC profiler is giving more insightful information on the total garbage collection process that happened during this entire micro benchmark run, which is 11 times. And the total duration for this uh, garbage collection is 17 microseconds. So with this, we'll move on to the CPU utilization metrics. So basically, if you want to know what is the, which part of your class, uh, so basically if you want to know like which part of your class is consuming too much of uh, CPU utilization, you can refer it from the top of the stack here. Okay, so here it is. So in this example, the regex.pattern.compile is a class which is consuming like 11.44 percentage of my CPU utilization. And the total process duration is listed here in the nanoseconds, right? So these are the insightful information that we get when we configure profilers along with the micro benchmark test. So now we know with the, with the help of various benchmark modes and all the profilers, we are able to identify all the KPE metrics, right? So in the next part of demo, we will see how do we write a proper micro benchmark scenario for a production like applications along with assertions, okay? So to demonstrate that we have created a simple application called product catalog converter, which is going to pass an Excel sheet like this. So this is my Excel sheet. So it has ID and products. So the code base is actually going to pass this Excel sheet and it is going to return a JSON structured object to me, okay? So let's say if you are asked to do a micro benchmark for this application, the first thing what we have to do is to identify what are all the methods for which we have to consider for micro benchmarking, right? So in this case, 
So that is going to be the entry point of this application or an entry point of an API. So we are considering this for writing a micro benchmark this now. So we have created a separate class for this. Yeah, it is here. So with the help of adbenchmark annotation, we are calling the product catalog converter.run. And since this run is a method that is expecting a file path, we know we saw earlier about this adparam annotation, right? With the help of adparam annotation, we are passing in the file path inside it. Again, the run method is going to bring me a JSON structured return time. So in order to avoid dead code elimination happening, I'm using this black hole dot fancy method here. So the scenarios that I'm going to write for this micro benchmark test is to identify what is going to be my load baseline test and what is going to be my uh, throughput baseline. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. Just give me a second. Okay, so what is going to be my load baseline test and what is going to be my throughput baseline test? Along with that, I'm also going to verify what is my volume metrics here, okay? So before the implementation part, we might have a question, right? So how are we going to configure all the benchmark modes? How are we going to configure various folks annotation, various values for warmups and measurements as well, right? So earlier, we have been seeing, right, like we, we have been adding everything as an annotation here, right? So adding it as an annotation here would be kind of static because for each of my micro benchmark scenario, the benchmark mode would be different because for my load baseline test, uh, for my load baseline test, I would be using the mode as average time. For my throughput baseline test, I would be using the mode as uh, throughput. So we have to find something that is dynamic in nature, correct? So instead of adding a, instead of adding it as an annotation, we can con we can configure everything here in the option builder itself. Okay. So we'll just get into one scenario and see how do we configure everything, and we'll also see how do we add assertions for this real micro benchmark scenario. Okay. So my first load scenario is about identify what is the average response time uh, when I'm running this method with 100 concurrent threads, okay? So this is my uh, J unit test. So we can basically run it with different ways. So when you're writing a micro benchmark test for your production like scenario, it is always recommend that we use any of the testing libraries. Here in this case, we are using J unit for this, okay? So with the help of option builder, I'm configuring the, I'm just calling the benchmark method inside it and I'm configuring the mode as average time here. And I'm interested to run this with 100 threads and then configuring the folks, warm up and measurement iterations and all. So in real time, right, it is always recommended that we write a micro benchmark method with minimum of five warm ups and measurement iteration in order to get an accurate result. So for demo purpose, we are just sticking it with one iterations here. And along with the average time, we are also going to evaluate what is the thread latency metrics, what is the CPU and memory utilization metrics. So in case of any assertion failure or any bottleneck that is observed, we can find the possible root cause with these three profiler metrics or profiler outputs, correct? And with the help of runner.run method, uh, I'm just running this test. It is in turn going to return me a run result object, which has all the metadata related to the score and error. The get score method here is fetching the score of this particular micro benchmark scenario. And with the help of assertion library, we are running it here. So it is very simple. We'll just run and see what is the status of this test case now. Go oh, say quick time check. Uh, sure, uh, and we'll just run fast. So the expected average time that we have set here is 0 0.02. So let's wait for the result. So it looks like uh, the test is failed because of, an, uh, because of an assertion failure. So the actual result that we have got here is 0 0.25 seconds. The expected one is 0 0.02 seconds, right? So this is how we have to write a proper micro benchmark scenario for a production like application. And uh, similar to the load baseline test, if you want to identify what is your throughput metrics, you can just uh, use the mode as throughput here. And in this example, the throughput expected throughput that we have set here is 3000 requests per second. And with the help of same assertion library, we are asserting it here. And for the volume metrics, what we are doing here is we have configured the mode as single short time. And in order to test this method, we have created a separate Excel sheet with 50 product catalog entries. And we are using this dot param method to override the at param annotation that we used earlier. So when you're running it, it is going to give us a response time against which you can assert it with the help of same assertion library also. So now with these assertions and all the micro benchmark scenarios, uh, these can be added to your uh, existing or new CACD pipeline, which is going to justify for your uh, uh, shift left of uh, performance testing, right? 
Um, I think, yes, with this, we are end of demo. We'll just try to answer uh, any open questions that are there and any new questions are also welcomed. Kapil, are there any open questions? <clears throat> no, Koshik. Uh, I think uh, participants feel free to ask any questions if you have. Yeah. Yeah, nothing is there over Q&A. In case Bangalore, Chennai, and Gurgaon has any questions, please feel free to ask. Oh, wait, if not, I'll have, be... I have a question. It's from Gurgaon. Yeah. Um, so uh, the things actually look good. So for example, if I have an API, as you already mentioned, probably may I'll ask the same question maybe. I have an API, REST API, right? I have the functions inside. So how do you suggest, do I... Uh, do the micro benching of uh, the method that is just present inside the API or maybe internally what the core part is happening inside the API. How do you suggest based on your experience? Kapil, would you like to take this or I can take this as well? Yeah, sure. So it's uh, it's depends like uh, um, if you want to check that as an end to end test, right? And you can also go for the uh, similar to the, similar to the example that Kaushik showed us, right? That run method. So that covers the uh, internal mechanisms uh, as well, what the transformation that we are doing, uh, everything. But if you, sometimes if we want to specify the check the IO operation that we have said, right? What uh, what is my volume? Uh, uh, if you want to check the volume for the uh, specific load, right? So at that time you can have the micro benchmark test specific to that to check the inner mechanism, like uh, what happens if uh, these ten 10,000 records, if you try to uh, fetch the 10,000 record from the database. So it depends again, uh, but if you think like, okay, these are the small, small methods which could not affect your performance, you can have that in the higher level of also. Okay, adding to Kapil's point, I have also written, it, uh, written the same stuff in the chat. So instead of writing micro benchmark tests for each method, right, you can also identify a feature and uh, a feature has more methods inside it, right? So let's say login as a feature. So when you when you go deeply, right, login has many methods inside it. You can also write a micro benchmark test for your feature as well. All right. Thank you so much. I think uh, this is one of the good understanding that we, we have received, at least uh, from the performance perspective. Um, any questions from anyone else? So uh, I have general approach, right? So micro versus macro bench, right? So at a project, do we start with macro bench and if the things are fine, don't go for micro bench? So basically, um, how the things are works in the project? No, it's completely a different way. Like uh, you have to start writing your micro benchmark test along with the images. That's what we are uh, in this talk, we are trying to highlight here. So it should be part of your development process itself. So that's where you can able to justify the shift flow as well. So the macro benchmark uh, purpose, the different uh, thing actually, uh, like I mentioned, right? You can uh, uh, use that in identifying the other bottlenecks except, you, except the code bottlenecks that you could get. So for that, having a profilers in place could also work in identifying those. But the uh, problem is when we, basically we have a requirement from client in terms of API sense, right? In general. <laughs> so improvements are endless. Basically, uh, how we benchmark micro bench, basically, I think because Let's say I have written my function and I know that this is taking this much time. That I, but uh, at up to what level? Because I I feel optimization when I I have to write. At the first go, I I just as a development theory, I just write a code because might be that is optimized or not optimized. That's so I just want to understand that the nature that a developer or the team feels, how it works in general. Okay, a uh, couple of just give a heads up maybe. So the reason why we brought this micro benchmark approach here is, it is a kind of unit test that we write for a feature. So micro benchmark is going to be your uh, unit test for the performance, right? So it is kind of best practice which we can follow when we write the code from the start itself. Instead of fine tuning the code at the later stage, you are just fine tuning, you are just deciding your goal and you are writing the code now. So which is kind of better approach instead of following the previous approach of optimizing it, optimizing it at the later stage. But the algorithm, right, uh, is optimized. We can we can calculate time or benchmark, right? Is it optimized 
no no algorithm can tell this is the best optimized right so this that that's why i'm talking about that i have used some kind of bubble sort i have to use insertion sort this micro bench thing will not tell me that right it's up to me right how much optimize i want to do so i should have something benchmarking in my mind that on from that angle i am just thinking uh, using this framework is good i understand but is it goes that level because i understand that this framework is will help me giving me function level at a my unit test level but when i am writing code right i don't know because silly mistakes i can find out <coughs> but how we so maybe benchmark our code that's a question okay so i'll just give you a simple example maybe so let's say you are writing a method so the expectation from business or expectation from your technical team is to have this method to be executed with the throughput matrix of 100 requests per second okay so inside your method you will be using any of your logical so it can be a bubble sort it can be of any sort algorithm okay so now you are writing a micro benchmark test for that so you see that the the expected throughput is not achieved with the current algorithm that you have because from jmh you are right you are trying to micro benchmark it with multiple warm up iterations and measurement iteration which is going to give you a similar result that it it gives in the production like environment okay so now you know the result and you you have a conclusion that hey this bubble sort algorithm is not fit is not going to fit for me i now have to choose another algorithm so that is what we are saying it it is a kind of unit test for your performance and thank you once again kosik and kapil for your wonderful talk thanks for listening thanks for listening thanks folks have a happy weekend yeah you too thanks